Father in heaven, I do ask that you would speak now for the next few minutes, that we would hear words from on high. And I pray that you would keep things simple. And that for those that may be watching, that are tuning in, I pray that the communication would remain strong. And I thank you now for guiding us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see if everything is just right now. It is. Good, okay. Well, tonight I'm going to explore a question. Namely, who is, who do you think we might consider tonight? Uh, Jesus, okay. But more specifically, I think we can turn that down. This seems awfully loud. We're going to look at who is the Son of Man. Of course, that is Jesus, but why that title? So, we'll start with this question here. Has anybody ever bothered to look in the Bible and just wondered how often he's called the Son of Man? Any idea? Let me say 60 times? Okay. 70? Oh, yeah, okay. 70, a multiple of seven, okay. Well, here's some statistics for you. In the Old Testament, just once. That's three quarters of the Bible. And then in the Gospels, you'll find it 86 times. Book of Acts, once. Did you know that Paul never uses that title? James through Jude never uses that title. And then in Revelation, it uses it twice. So you might be surprised at sort of the uh, concentration of the, the usage there. But at least it tells us where to look if we want to start exploring what, what does it mean when Jesus is called the Son of Man? So, what does it mean? Let me just ask you, what are some thoughts that come to mind? When you see that phrase, you say, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is X. Nature of Christ, okay. Human nature of Christ, okay. All right, as opposed to the Son of God, all right. All right, any other thoughts out there? No? Okay. Well, I kind of anticipated some of those. We've got, you know, the Son of God became a man, right? And shows how closely he identifies with man. But my question is, is there, is there more? Can we be more specific? And I think we can. So we're going to look at a few slides here. So first, a good place to begin is always the beginning. So I, I'll start with the first instance of that title for Jesus. Anybody know what book that's found in? Daniel, that's right. Daniel, the seventh chapter, and here is the verse. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold... One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Well, there's the phrase, but there's not a whole lot to work with right there, especially if maybe you're not familiar with the book of Daniel. So let, let's go back one verse just to get some context. Or not one verse, excuse me, but a few verses. Verses 9 and 10, it speaks, it says, The thrones were cast down, or they were set, and the Ancient of Days did sit. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So, if we start right there, we say, okay, the Son of Man, he's called that in the context of judgment. That gives us something. He comes before the Ancient of Days. And that, who is that, by the way? Okay, that's the Father, all right. And he comes to the judgment. But what does he do with the judgment? You can't base a whole lot on just what we read there. And why is he called the Son of Man? Why not just come right out and say Jesus or maybe the Son of God or... Messiah. Why does it use that title? So we have to do a little more exploring. So who is the Son of Man? Let's take a look here. Did you know Jesus actually asked that very question? Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he says that he is the Son of Man, but he asked the question, who is the Son of Man? And the disciples gave a variety of answers, and they said, well, some say this and some say that, but Peter Jesus commended him because he knew that the Father had shown him something. And notice what Peter says. Oh, that should be Matthew 13. Oh, I've got something mixed up. I think it's 16, 13 and 16, 16. Anyways, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay. So notice this. It goes on some other places in Matthew, and he says this, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, right? That sounds very much like what the Son of the living God might do. 
He also says in verse 12, uh, 12, verse 8, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. That makes sense. God created it. And so the Son of Man is also the Son of the living God. He has these various prerogatives there. That gives us a little more insight. But notice this. Things get more interesting. As you, as you go on a little further, Matthew, Matthew 17, verses 9 and 12, we read, it says, the son, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead, Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. So we know the Son of Man is going to suffer and he's going to die. And he experienced death, he does, he experiences death just like we do. Well, not that we crucify, but I mean, he undergoes death just as we all undergo death. But that begs another question. Why would he do this? This all has to do with why he's called the Son of Man. Why would he do this? Well, the Bible gives us some, some insight. Notice this right here. Matthew 18, verse 11. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Okay? So let's put a few pieces together. He comes to save what is lost. And what is lost, of course, is all of us. So he's come to save you and he's come to save me. But here's the rub. You only say something if you love it. And, you can go a step further, you only die to save something if you love it supremely. Okay, that has some, that's something to do with the Son of Man. He has a deep love, and he comes to save by death that which is lost. But let's dig just a little more. In Ephesians 5, we get an idea of what, what exactly that means. In verses 28 and 29, it says here, Paul talks about, he says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, his flesh, even as the Lord does the church. Hmm, okay. So notice, we just said you only die for something you love supremely. Christ loves the church as his own flesh if we follow that reasoning right there. Because he took on her flesh so that he could become one with her. Hmm. So it has something to do with love that leads to becoming one. Let's go on a little further here. You know, Jesus, when he becomes one with us, that means so much. And there's a passage in Hebrews that helps us to better appreciate this. It says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, those he came like, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he's God, right? God can't be tempted, and yet he condescended to allow himself to be tried, to be tested, so he could enter into our experience. Uh, elsewhere, in chapter 4, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But see, when you put this in light of all these other texts, you realize we're invited to come boldly before the throne of one who said, I want to be so much like you or to be one with you that I will come as you, I will die for you. I'm doing all I can to save you. And lest you be um, intimidated because you know that you're, you know, soiled with sin, you don't need to be afraid to come. This is the one place you need to come. So please come boldly to the throne and let me do this work so that we can be one. This is the Son of Man. So Jesus, he already knows us fully, not just because of omniscience and he knows all about us. It, it's further than that. It's by experience. He's already gone through all the, the, the unfortunate things that we go through. He understands all these various temptations because in one way or another, he was tempted like as we are. So he knows us by experience. That's, that's real intimate knowledge. Oops, notice this. John 5 it says, the Father judges no man, the Ancient of Days. The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. 
and notice it expands on who the son is here, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Do you ever think about that? That's the Think of judgment as, you know, okay, ooh, guilty. No, that's not the idea. God says, we've, had, we've, we've come up with the plan of salvation, and because you have submitted to the idea of going down as the mediator, dying for people, fully experiencing, becoming one, because of all that, you now, because of that, are the one that is qualified to execute judgment. Not as being mean, but because you would be the only one in all the universe that could make the wisest decisions. You know what's right. So the Son of Man is per permitted to sit on the throne as the judge. Oops, here we go. Because he is fully identified with us. Because he knows us fully. This is why. A couple more thoughts here. Notice I titled this, The Son of Man Cometh, right here. Well, look at some texts. As you go on in Matthew, you suddenly come across one text after another. It talks about the Son of Man comes, comes, comes. Look at these. So Matthew 24, 27. As the lightning cometh out of, you know, the east, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He doesn't say the coming of Jesus. He calls himself the Son of Man in this context. Hmm. Then he goes, oops, in verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 44, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Two more. Matthew 25, verse 13, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And finally, later in the same chapter, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. In those five verses right there, what's the simplest understanding when you think, keep talking about the Son of Man cometh? What, what's this discussing? Okay, good. This is no mystery. This is the second coming. But he keeps identifying himself as the Son of Man when he comes. Now, the Son of Man is the one who loved supremely, gave his life, is the one who's qualified to judge. All of this rolls together. Notice this. Who is the Son of Man coming for? What's that? His brethren. Oh, okay. It did refer to us as brethren. That's right. That is correct, but it becomes a little more beautiful if you look at this, although that is true. Let's look at the second coming. In Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, right before the second coming, it, it tells us this. There is a, I don't want to use the word commotion, there's a, a, a clamor in heaven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb, that would be Jesus, is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And so you have this, this big excitement. You know, all of heaven's been watching, and finally the moment is ready, and they say, aha, we see she's ready. Now, Jesus, he knows all about time. When she's ready, what do you suppose he does? This is not a hard question. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't say, well, you know, I have a few other things to tend to. She's ready. She can hold on. I'm sure she'll do fine. No. He has been 6,000 years, roughly, this has been raging, right? He says, all right. And notice, it's, it's like this. Let's mount up and go get her. Notice, he, the wife gets ready, and then you read in just a very few verses later, verse 11 through 16, abbreviating it somewhat, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called, notice capital letters, so this is Jesus, faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. I saw an angel standing in the sun. We're not going to break that all down. That's not the point. But I hope that you are aware that this is talking about the second coming. And if you didn't, just, it is. Now, what I would like you to notice is this. The whole book of Revelation is about preparing his bride. So he's coming for his bride here at the second coming. 
Could I draw your attention to a couple of phrases? Actually, I think it's three phrases here. Ah, okay. His eyes were as a flame of fire, unusual for someone coming for a bride, but it does say that. It mentions a sharp sword, and it mentions the sun, okay? Now, I point that out because that is kind of unusual. Why does it stick those details in? Here's the punchline. Why don't we see if we see that somewhere else in Revelation? If I could get this, here we go. Notice how the book of Revelation opens. It says that in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Is that similar, you think? Okay, let me put it in bold here. The Son of Man has eyes as a flame of fire. The Son of Man has the sharp two-edged sword. And there it is again. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. By the way, he is the angel in the sun there in Revelation 19, if you've never realized that before. So all three things match right there. So in Revelation 19, the second coming, it's the Son of Man coming and it's for his bride. The book opens all introducing the bridegroom. It kind of sets the stage. Okay, this is the bridegroom. We're looking at the wedding and we're going forward. That's who this is. So the one who comes for his bride is the Son of Man. So now the Son of Man, we can look at it in terms of the one who marries. So look, look at this. Jesus became as one of us, right? He condescended. He became Son of Man. And then it also says, as the Son of Man, he took his bride's nature so he could rightly become one flesh with her. How can you become one flesh if you're a different nature? Right? The Bible forbids things that are dissimilar from coming together. But now who is his bride? Well, look at this. According to 2 Peter 1.4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this is what we may become. So kind of in parallel with the previous screen, if we submit, which that's what a bride does, Jesus enables us to do this, partake of his divine nature, so that as sons of God, we may rightly become one flesh with him. Isn't that beautiful? He had to come first to initiate things, to start becoming one flesh with us, but he says, but we can't stay like that. That's, not, that's never going to work. He never yielded to sin. We have. So he says, I've got to do, I won't even call it a repair job, just a complete replacement, an overhaul of our nature. So he says, if you'll let me, I'll make your nature like mine. Not that we become God, but we'll have his character. And then he says, then we can live as a man and wife forever. And you realize that means he's the king of the universe, right? Do you realize if we sit on thrones of him, that's like we're, depending on how you look at it, I guess queens, if we're his bride, right? In other sense, we're like kings. Can you imagine? The worst sinners in the world, and yet he says, I'll elevate you above even angels, and you can rule on the God's throne? Angels right now veil their faces, but we as his bride can look without shame directly in his face, and it will not be grounds for you know, extermination. He'll say, no, you're my bride. This is incredible. So, decision here. The Son of Man loves you, loves me, so much that he does these things. He became like you, like me, taking our nature. He experienced all the struggles that we have experienced. So if you think you're going through a bad time, he knows all about it by experience. He died to save you. And he judges you not to say guilty, 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 but to transform you. That's the whole point of the judgment, is to transform us, to make us like him. So if we kind of flip this on its head and turn it around into what we might do, I can ask this question. Do you desire such a love for the Son of Man that you would let him transform you as he judges you? You want to be his bride? Sit on the throne? That you might die too, but to your own selfish nature that you might experience true freedom with him instead of all the, the filth and heartache that we experience now. And finally, that we can become like him forever one flesh with him. Does that sound good? If that's your decision, I would invite you right now, just let's kneel together and start the school year off with this, this picture of the Son of Man.
Father in heaven, we've only scratched the surface here, but I, I hope some thoughts have been shared that are fairly simple, that would just show how much you love us, that you, that you sent your son, you, 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 he humbled himself to become like us. And he, he went through everything so that he could fully identify and he would know exactly how to minister our needs so that we could, by faith, take hold of him and step by step be transformed into his lovely image as conquerors, as overcomers. And I pray that right now that those who are here who, I mean, in an audience this size, there are bound to be those who are struggling with decision, who may have never committed or maybe they've gone through some heartache where it does look like from experience that, that we are forsaken. I pray that tonight's talk might bolster their courage and they would, even if but quietly, just surrender and say, okay, Jesus, please, let's start, it, start over with me. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would give us sweet dreams tonight, that we'd have some, some thoughts to consider, to mull over, that would give us hope and encouragement as we finish out this week. And I thank you now. Let us use our time productively for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.